from Cartoon Network's official Twitter account, and I quote, Steven Universe drawn in different styles of the decades. The blue pencil is apt enough, but putting four whole colours on this palette might have been a touch optimistic. Which is your favourite? Frankly, I'm struggling to pick just one. Shaggy's Hobbit stunt double, buck-toothed baby Bluto, even the way old Steve wears Astro Boy's gruesomely decapitated head like a Halloween mask, permanently frozen in a morbid facsimile of joy, just kinda speaks to me. Only problem is, instead of actually capturing the aesthetics of these periods, CN just opted to trade Steve's woolly noodle for an uncolored sketch of somebody else's severed scone and then clocked out for the week. But we can do this thing the right way. Let's go through them together one by one and see what Steven would really look like through the decades of cartoon history. Coming to you from beautiful downtown Fortitude Valley, it's the Harry Gold Show with your host, Harry Gold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the program. The big animation networks enjoy exweeting out characters in a motley array of art styles almost as much as they love rushing underpaid and underqualified artists. It's been a match made in heaven. That said, while Team Mickey and the Sponge Factory are content to put as little effort as possible into ringing engagement from their fans, our piebald pals over at Cartoon Network have consistently set themselves apart with their own novel approach. Get this actually trying. In stark contrast to the competition, today's subject is perfectly well drawn. This illustration was actually made all the way back in 2020, when Donald Trump was seeking re-election, all the kids were playing Fortnite and Roblox, and Disney was hemorrhaging Star Wars fans. What a different time that was. I was only made aware of this illustration recently, when Hanna-Barbera Screen Caps tweeted it out, and some of you beautiful people at home saw fit to let me know about it. It's a little different to our usual style swaps, but I welcome the opportunity to mix things up. After all, there's only so many ways I can tell you Ed, Ed and Eddie's art style is shaky, wobbly, frantic, erratic, frenetic, tremulous, hectic, screwy, neurotic, before things get a little repetitive. The 1930s marked the debut decade for barge loads of history's hottest toon talents. From Bugs Bunny, to Donald Duck, to... Benito Mussolini. Disney was goofing, Fleischer was booping, and the New Deal era's mildly disquieting animation aesthetic was smushed in somewhere betwixt. While this grimacing goofbag could probably use some braces on his teeth and acne cream on his kneecaps, the real ish here is that he looks about as period authentic as a tuxedo print tracksuit. For starters, stylistically, those crooked blue Pac-Man lodged in his eye socket seem to be gunning for Steamboat Willie's well-exploited corner of the public domain. Even though that's a 1920s cartoon whose licorice limbed aesthetic had gone the way of the Dramecio Mimus by the time the 30s were packing it in. But overall, the fashion of yesteryear just doesn't quite jibe with that aesthetic black hole we call 21st century menswear. I mean, for the love of Herbert Hoover, nobody dressed like this in the 30s. Men were trying on their first necktie before the umbilical cord was cut in those days. Not only were the only folks wearing denim off mining for black lung, but graphic tees hadn't even been invented yet. And flip-flops were but a twinkle in the eye of an American soldier who saw Japanese sandals during the war and immediately thought of a great way to ruin footwear forever. Then of course, let's not forget Stevie's sideburns nearly fro. Quite apart from apparently trying to hide cornrows under an inflatable rubber toupee, the only men game enough to rock this do in the Hindenburg years were pitching pies at Pagliacci. That means Stephen here definitely needs a good pruning. As for design trends of the Great Depression, money was scarce in those days. So to save on the cost of eyeballs, they had incomplete pupils and only two thirds of their eyelids shaded in. Those classic cartoon gloves saved studios a bundle on skin colored paint too. Oh, and to get around our little ahistorical fashion faux pas, I've instead given Steve a five-pointed belt buckle on extra high-waisted trousers, which was the style at the time. And now, before we continue, here's a word from this episode's sponsor. His name? Secret Agent Rick Razor. Occupation? Top spy for a secret organization called the Manly Agents, neatly shaving chins and punishing evildoers. Manscaped for short. Hey, where'd he go? Nowhere to cut and run this time, Razor. That trapdoor you're standing on leads to a bottomless pit. But there's no situation too hairy for Rick Razor. All right, Agent Razor, take this disguise in our newest spy gadget. We have codenamed it the Lawn Mower. It gives you more grooming flexibility than ever before with next-gen interchangeable blade heads. The newly improved skin-safe trimmer blade features longer wider and rounder teeth that cut through hair with ease. And the new skin safe foil shaving blade is perfect for a clean shaven look. It also has an enhanced LED spotlight for high visibility when shaving the darkest corners. The dual temperature light feature that caters to multiple skin tones. What's that? Where? Hey, what? It guards. Quick. There's a conspicuously clean shaven intruder in the secret lair. Mm. Now that was a 
close sale. Get the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra for 20% off plus free shipping and two gifts with promo code Harry Gold at manscaped.com slash the Harry Gold Show. I'd say it's also a pretty peculiar choice to foist this Greek flag colour palette on all our scrawly Steves. The whole set looks like some dull-eyed teen doodled them in the margins of his math homework as a result. Which I guess might evoke some strain of nostalgia for anyone with enough pent-up Stockholm Syndrome to have actually enjoyed school. But sans the colours, line styles or desperate content warnings unique to these eras, it's just not quite having the intended effect. Though what we do have on this one isn't doing that much more to help. The 40s were the stomping ground of Mickey Mouse and Tom and Jerry. But while the other illustrations all draw connections that are direct to the point of plagiarism, from an aesthetic perspective this just kind of wafts amorphously between generic children's book illustration and that one Family Guy skit where they sing about pie. Also, because the star print T is still a no bueno for this nook of the 20th century, this time I'm dressing him up in an appropriately patterned necktie. Well honestly, I'm impressed with this one. Put yourself in Stevie's shoes, and I use the word shoes loosely. It's not easy for an American kid in the 50s to draw himself like Astro Boy. Considering that cartoon was made in 1963, but the manga was made in the 50s. Mr. Manga was made in the 50s. It wasn't imported till decades later. The only manga anyone in the West had heard of back then was selling fish in England. What? Like, fish manga, get it? The accent, the manga sounds like manga. It, it, I have nothing but questions. Why is this face so bootleggy? Have his fingers been amputated, or is this just some kind of full body samurai sock? And I mean, really, whose first thought on mention of the 50s is Astro Boy? The Japanese! I hear some pedantic weeb squawk in the comments. Well, guess what, you easily torn down straw man, you. Last I checked, the top manga of 2003 wasn't The Grim Adventures of Billy and Flippin' Mandy. The real epitome of 50s cartoon aesthetics, to my mind, is that period's highly stylized, modern art-inspired animation that sort of looks like if Picasso made a comic strip. And on the fashion front, this was still commie girl hair in those days, so Steve is definitely getting a trim. I'm also running out of excuses to put a star on the front of his outfit that don't involve cowboy boots or devil worship, so we'll have to settle for a loosely patriotic button on his jacket. Now that is just off-brand Elroy Jetson with what appears to be the shoulder pads from Michael Jackson's Thriller. Except, instead of EJ's usual baseball cap, he's sporting some manner of space-age yarmulke. Uh, seeing as Steve's Mars are talking space rock and Greg Universe isn't really giving chosen people, I'm gonna guess he's a convert. What's that, you say? Well, that wasn't incomprehensible enough for you? Well, friend, then you are in luck. Cause Steve of the swingin' 60s is also decked out with the self-tying sneakers from Back to the Future 2, a 1980s movie series that also takes place in the 50s, 2010s, and 1880s. That's funny, I'm not seeing any 60s here. Am I experiencing some kind of rapid onset dyslexia? Or was quality control just taking a personal day? As for what makes our most iconic style of this decade, CN was at least shambling in the correct general direction. Aesthetically, it's nearly just the 50s animation look ground up and spat out by Hanna-Barbera's newly minted cartoon sausage machine. Low effort, low cost, and low key still looks nicer than anything Comedy Central has ever touched. Fashion update, this just in. Graphic tees do now officially exist as of this decade, but we still have some time to kill before the mainstream standards were low enough to actually put up with Oh, what's this? Has YouTube got its wires crossed and accidentally patched you through to a simple flip stream? Senor Pello, perhaps? No, in fact, that's just Cartoon Network's best attempt at a 70s version of Steven Yu, which apparently is just to make Shaggy his very own dumpy little scrappy do equivalent. Does this imply that somewhere else in the world Shaggy's body is running around with Steven's head on it? Like Zoink Scoob, I suddenly have the urge to talk about feelings with my magic lesbian bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shaggy was technically a 1969 creation, we'll let that slide, because in the next segment I'm going to make the exact opposite complaint. I try to be scrupulous, you know? I keep my acts of blatant hypocrisy behind closed doors, where the Harry, colon, also Harry, colon, comments can't get me. <laughs> 
The real trick is picking out the true main style of the 70s. Animation in those days was as stagnant as Kevin Spacey's acting career. The Flintstone Farm and House of Mouse both continued to look largely as they did in the previous decade, just with a few more flares and platform shoes. To my mind, the truly emblematic animation styles of the period are all the smaller projects, the kind of thing you'd see on PBS or in an ad. Cheap, loose, messy drawings by cheap, loose, messy hippies. As for fashion, sadly, we've finally reached a point where the T jeans and mop are perfectly plausible. Though bell bottoms and burks are probably more likely from the waist down. The Simpsons are as quintessentially 90s as listening to the Spice Girls, playing Super Nintendo, or lying under oath about Monica Lewinsky. And in all 700 plus episodes, a grand total of one aired in the 1980s. There is mathematically more evidence that The Simpsons is the quintessential art style of Dave Grohl's birthday than of the entire Reaganomic decade. Yet our checker print chums have nonetheless decided to Simpsonize 80s Steven like he's some family of unimaginative suburbanites. In actuality, the 80s was absolutely the era of the Saturday morning cartoon, and there were two diverging paths the style could take. Entirely dependent on the themes and aesthetics of whatever toy the show was cynically shilling to kids. If your program was a thinly veiled ploy to market cute toys like Care Bears or My Little Ponies, we had a squishy cheeked, shiny eyed style so insincerely cutesy and saccharine you'll need a shot of insulin just to last till the first commercial. On the other hand, if your animation was instead a barely disguised advertisement for action figures like He-Man and G.I. Joe, everything was bulging muscles and blaring electric guitars in a Chad jawed superhero style as aesthetic. And they've finally done it. This design approach appears to be Dexter-esque. As in, Zlaboratory, not starring Michael Z. Hall. Which for the first time on this poster is both the correct decade and the right kind of style. Much like the 80s, the quintessential animation look of the Seinfeld years could cut two ways. In one corner, by this point all the 50s kids had grown up to go on one big fat nostalgia bender. Not only did this give you throwbacks like Animaniacs and Ren and Stimpy, but it also resulted in a return of that mid-century modernist approach in shows like Powerpuff Girls and Johnny Bravo. Highly stylized silhouettes, graphic simplicity, and outlines that give you more variable width than putting Jonah Hill's filmography on shuffle. All the while, competing with this baby boomer reminiscence kick was Klasky Chupo's style of omnipresent overbite. These aggressively ugly character designs with wired eyes and creepy teeth were crawling all over the last leg of the 20th century. And now we return to your regularly scheduled face swapping instead of the style change we were promised. This is just Billy and Mandy, but without the end Mandy and adding a receding hairline. You know, I realize it's typical for guys' hair to thin past a certain age, but uh, is it normal for their toes to fall out too? The prototypical style of the turn of the century, in my indomitably humble opinion, is a natural progression of the 90s version of the 60s version of the 50s look. Something wedged between Hanna-Barbera's softcore cubism and Microsoft Word clip art. It tends towards severe angles, blubbery outlines, and the kind of eyeball asymmetry you'd normally only see adapted on a popsicle. At long last, we arrive at Steven's home decade and his very own notoriously 2010s CalArtsy aesthetic. At least this one's on model. I'm sure the fact that it's traced didn't hurt, of course. But you know, some time has passed since that drawing was made now. We're at least spleen deep in the 2020s at this point, so why not take a crack at guessing what this decade's foremost art style will be? It's easier said than done, of course. Just about the only animations major networks are willing to make these days are reboots and spin-offs cannibalizing the styles of yesteryear. Otherwise, you've got... what? Bluey? Smiling Friends? At this particular moment, I suppose it feels like the most prevalent animation style of these modern times is that inoffensively bland yet truly unpleasant adult animation look. The one that's like some heinous mutant gene splice of Family Guy, Rick and Morty and a bit Moji. But with the 2020s less than half done at time of recording, we'll need some more time in the oven before we know where the real heart and soul, or perhaps distinct lack thereof, truly lies for this decade's animation scene. And so, that is a whole multiverse worth of Stevens through history fixed. If somehow the artist of the original had the misfortune to find him or herself this deep in the video, I am truly sorry. Like the movie mobsters say, it's nothing poisonal. Just business. In all seriousness, I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a twinge of guilt about slamming all these style swappers work. It's never been my aim to hurt anybody's feelings with the possible exception of whoever designed our real monsters. Ugh, disgusting. 
But at the same time, I just can't abide large corporations effectively being able to use unfortunate staffers as human shields to render themselves immune to criticism of the often rushed and unfinished work they willingly and cynically publish. So to those networks, I say this. Keep up the great work. Keep doing exactly what you're doing. It helps me out a lot. Let's play a game. I'll draw someone famous, and three people that guess who it is in the comments will get a shout out in the next episode. If your guess last time was the internet musician Charlie Green, aka CG5, you are absolutely correct. Charlie's rule from the Wheel of Winners is... The last three people to guess correctly at time of recording. I've got news for the hybrid fox, you're in first place. Rolo Demon possessed the knowledge required to get second, and Galf the boy wasn't kidding around when he took the bronze. Well done everyone, thanks for playing. This week's subject has lips so permanently pursed they could be sponsored by Prada. Those big shadowy eyes of theirs have more dark bags under them than Balenciaga's Christmas tree. And this person's chin is so tremendous in its bulk that they've been court ordered to avoid tilting their head too far back for fear of causing a solar eclipse. This quip brought to you by Gucci. Now who could this be? If you know who that was, let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, consider checking out the other style swaps we've done through the eras. But this has been The Harry Gold Show. So until next time, stay safe, and God bless.